Opening statements now from Trevor Newby. Thank you. Um, let, let me start maybe by making a correction to my uh, CV there. I'm not the, cha the chief executive of the Malian Garden. I'm the deputy chairman. Um, otherwise, somebody's going to get me fired. Um, <laughs> I, 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 don't know, I don't know whether I'm the only one who noticed something odd with the video colors up there. Did, did somebody notice something odd? OK. Um, did also somebody notice something odd about the imagery uh, around Africans and black people um, on, the other vid on the other video that was aired? Was, am I the only one who noticed it, or there's some people who did? I'm glad I'm not the only one. OK, what I, I think it, t it takes us to, it's about education and information. That's why I'm raising it. The video about colors did not make a single mention of a single African country, or an Arab country, or China. Was China mentioned? Maybe not. Um, why am I saying this? Um, there's a billion Africans in the world, in, in Africa. And that video purported that we are these happy colors, but included, excluded a billion Africans from that video. For um, somebody who's passionate about information and our, our subject being education, I thought the colors video was misleading in a huge way. Then the second issue around the imagery of the African around um, desperate circumstances, starvation, war uh, is the imagery that the Western media tends to run at all times. Neglecting thousands of beautiful stories that are coming from the African continent and from most parts of the world which is colored. That's misinformation. That's, pro that's, that's propagating an image of Africa which is no longer true. So I'm, I'm, that's, that is not where I was going to start. That was not going to be my presentation. But that video provoked me uh, because we are tired of the perpetuation of an African imagery by Western media, which either neglects the fact that Africans exist and they live a happy life, and wants to continually uh, spread the notion that Africans live in desperate times, all times, that is not correct. <laughs> so, what does this, where does this lead me to? They, uh, by the way, in my culture, they say it's not polite to criticize your host. I'm sort of criticized you, but uh, it's, it's important that I do that. Um, where, does it, where, where do I stand vis-a-vis um, -vis the, the, the subject that we, we're looking at? I'm very uncomfortable when we talk about a, a media playing an educational role for the reasons that I've just outlined right now by those two videos. I think it's um, pre preposterous and presumptuous for media to think that they play an educational role. And I say that because I find in most instances that my audience is much more educated than me. My audience is much more informed than me. I own newspapers in South Africa and in Zimbabwe. And I think we're being presumptuous and preposterous if we think that we can educate our audience. There's something exciting and dynamic that is taking place in the societies that we live in, societies that are evolving, societies that are producing people that are much more informed than us. So what is the role of media then? I do concede from the start that um, ratings are a very important thing. Vait ratings, particularly on television, for us in newspapers, readership is an important thing. But what, at the end of the day, how do you ensure that you've got good ratings 
And how do you ensure that uh, the people still come back to read you? And this is what I think. I think that our role is to inform. Sometimes we do get things wrong, but we do, if we do get things wrong, what's going to happen is that the audience is going to migrate and go somewhere where they'll get the right information. Our role is to in, empower. To some extent, our role is in, to entertain. Our role is to, we can be presumptuous and say we've got a watchdog role. Um, our role is to try and promote accountability. I like the, word, the use of your word, engage. Um, our role is to engage, and our role is to be relevant. Engage and, rele and, 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 and be relevant uh, with, our, with our audiences. We, we have, um, how do we do that? In the midst of all the challenges that we do have, we do that by ensuring that we have good quality content that we are insightful in the things that we do, that we have an analysis, intelligent commentary. But much more importantly these days, in all that we do, it's important that we collaborate with the audiences that we purport to be working and writing for. Otherwise, we run the risk of being irrelevant. There's a lot of conversations that are taking place. As I'm talking to you right now, there's a lot of you that are tweeting and retweeting what I'm saying. I have no control over that. But that's a huge part of what goes on in terms of the conversations that we start. The trickeries that the professor talked about. We need to be aware of, of, of all those. But I, I think the, for me, the fun foundation, which is uns unshakable, for media and the role that we play is the importance at all times to ensure integrity in what we do. These are, these are big words, but important words. Is there integrity in what you're doing? Are you ethical? Are you professional? What is it that we're trying to achieve? I think the question that we needs to be answered is, for me, if we are to compete in terms of getting the readership and the ratings is, what kind of a society are we building as media? And what kind of a society do we want to live in? And indeed, what kind of a society do we want to live for our children? Then begins to arise issues around, I mean, what kind of an environment do we want? You know, we talk about global warming and all those kind of things. I, I think, for me, our responsibility as media is a huge responsibility. It's a responsibility that determines how the world lives or the, how the world dies. And if we pursue ratings at the total exclusion of integrity, then we have a problem. I'm sure I'll have an, uh, an opportunity later on to engage with all of you, but I suspect I've got your attention. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Trevor, for those comments. Very stimulating, very provocative, yeah, I think. Uh, absolutely uh, com compelling stuff. Uh, Dr. Christoph Erhard, your initial comments. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you. Well, I guess for some of you might think uh, that guy on that podium is somehow the, the fish in the birdcage or the bird in the fishbowl, whatever you mean, um, because I'm the professional communicator of the company who at the same time is uh, one of the sponsors of that event here. And I'm sit sitting here at a panel that discusses about um, quality of media and ratings. Uh, well, I think there is, apart from just being the representative of the host here, there is a way to attach our role as a company to the discussion here, and there are actually two dimensions to it. The first dimension would be, and you might be surprised if I say that, but in some respect we're brothers in arms with the media, because as a company which is represented in 220 countries around the globe, pretty sure representing also the nations uh, that you come from to this place here, 
as has actually just one constituency we are not present in, which is Turkmenistan, for whichever strange reason. But apart from that, you will not find a place in the world where you will not have a, a local DHL operator. In fulfilling our role of being a global trade facilitator, we also create a medium of exchange. We connect cultures and people with the goods we transport, apart from the fact that uh, in Germany, our biggest market, we had a company that since 500 years in the meantime, secures fast, reliable, and, uh, and private exchange between individuals who send each other's letters. We move about 5% of world trade every day, and as a company of that size, we really contribute to what the Clutra Manifesto in the days of the new economy so nicely said, that markets can be conversations. If you want to, we contribute to that ongoing dialogue of people around the world being uh, interacting with each other. Last year, actually, to find out better how we influence uh, in that endeavor um, the globe, we did a study which we call the Global Connectedness Index, which draw a conclusion between the prosperity of a nation and its interconnectedness with global trade, uh, which came to the maybe not surprising result that uh, a national economy which is well connected to global trade tend to cater its society also with more prosperity uh, and access to goods and services for daily life. Uh, but it, interestingly enough, the researcher who did the study, a former Harvard professor who in the meantime teaches at IESA University in Barcelona, Pankaj Gemava, um, he in included in the study also a section on uh, the way a nation, a national economy, allows access to global media and allows a free flow of information in that society. And interestingly enough, the level of prosperity of a nation was also related to the openness to information, uh, freedom of speech and other related elements. Um, which again, uh, in my view at least, showed me nicely how the topics uh, come together. I should also say in that respect that um, us contributing as a company to the flow of, of goods and information globally. We also have our own interest in education. Um, and we're represented here actually in that program uh, with a workshop um, with a partner, which is uh, the SOS Children's Village, um, which is only one of the initiatives we drive in order to give underprivileged children access to high quality education. Um, not only, but also to allow them to be grown up and educated citizens as um, uh, requested for in our very impressive introductory lecture. The second element of how we are attached to the topic is, well, we are an object of media coverage. Um, and if you are active in the way we are in so many, many countries, every day you are interacting with not only journalists here in our headquarter country, Germany, but actually everywhere around the world. And um, some of the challenges which were mentioned here, um, like the challenge between uh, quality on one side and uh, good ratings on the other side, is also challenges that we encounter. Uh, some, maybe most of you might say, well, for good reasons, and if I take off my jacket at the evening, I'm just a citizen, I agree. But sometimes also we have a hard time because the, the number of journalists who have enough time and resources to be uh, in a dialogue with uh, a company or an institution in a well-informed way that allows them to create uh, coverage that suffices with their own quality standards. In my experience, and I do communication since about 20 years now, that ability is diminishing year by year, uh, which leads, I'm pretty sure, also in your case, to the observation that sometimes there is just a very small group of journalists in front of a large bunch of PR folks trying to tell them what the truth is, truth is or what isn't. Uh, but you shouldn't think that this is very nice for us either. So um, we are somehow connected to the topic, maybe in a different way than others are, but I feel in any case extremely flattered and honored that you allow me to that distinguished group here. Thank you. A great pleasure. Thank you for those comments. Yeah. Thank you to everybody for those initial comments. What comes to my mind initially is that I, uh, you two began here, uh, Lynn and Charlotte, uh, on, on the left, talking about a great array of programming that you have been able to put together that appears to be enlightened uh, programming that answers the question, is there a mission for, me for the media to educate 
the, the, question from, the answer to that question from you two ladies would appear to me to be a very affirmative yes. I'm guessing, yeah, but it sounded, yeah, I guess right, yeah? Yes, yeah. Yes. Okay, okay. <laughs> but then Trevor stands up and says, educating people is wrong, effectively. Yeah? He says that's not what the media ought to be doing. How do you feel about that when he says that? I mean, he clearly sees a huge problem, a huge contradiction, mm -hmm. and you're sitting pretty here saying, well, this is what we do. We take our message out into the world. Well, it, it's not just our message, and in the case of U.S. international broadcasting, in fact, it's neutral news and information in addition to programs by which people can exchange opinions and connect with one another. So we don't actually have a mission to uh, bring opinion from the United States government, that's the uh, rest of the government's uh, business. What we do in U.S. international broadcasting is educate, inform, enlighten through conversation and through news. Mm. So uh, to answer your question directly, when I hear someone else get up and say, well, the media don't have a mission to educate, I say, well, that's your opinion, and that's good, and we can exchange opinions, and through that, we can educate one another. <laughs> Charlotte. Um, I don't know how much of it is semantics, but I, I guess I'd like to enter it from a different direction, which is to um, really capture something that I thought was extremely important that Trevor said in terms of the images that are presented on the screen. And for children, which is really what our thrust is, but I think this applies to adults as well, um, so many children throughout the world live in, in parts of the world where the images that they're seeing on the screen are dominated by images from other countries, not their own. And when they do see things on the screen from their own country, it comes from the journalistic media. So a lot of the images that they're seeing of themselves are, are negative because it's about a news story that might be something, um, you know, that has some kind of conflict in it or that it's being told because it's news. And your point, I think, about the opportunity to show daily life experiences and the positive parts of people's lives is so often lost in the television that children are seeing. And um, I know that one of the things that we're really trying to do, and whether you call this education or not, I don't know. It's maybe a definitional thing. But one of the things we're trying to do is work with producers in country in South Africa, in other parts of Africa, and other parts of the world, where the stories that are being presented on the screen are reflecting the lives of the children that it's reaching. And we're doing this in the stories that you see in you know, Sesame Street, and then documentaries of children's lives, real children, not actors, presenting just what they're doing every day. And what we found is that those kinds of live action films, those kinds of stories are extremely popular with children because it's giving them an opportunity to see kids like themselves on the screen, kids wearing clothes that are similar to the clothes they wear, going to schools that look like the kinds of schools that they go to, um, engaged in activities that are meaningful to them and relevant. So, I'd, I don't know if I can enter the debate of is that education or not, but I think to me, one of the most potent things you said was the power of the images that, that are on the screen and making sure that those are both created by local people, it's created by the people who they're the images of, and getting them out to the children so that they're seeing themselves reflected. Can I just follow through on one of, one of the things you've been saying, because it's quite important, because you're talking about your very impressive activities in children's education. And the, the, there is a tendency, I think it's fair to say, to most people would say educating children using the media, using broadcasting, yes, people would nod. And then people tend to balk and have more inhibitions, see more contradictions when, it, when we talk about educating adults. What's your comment on that? How do you, how do you shift what you've learned about educating children into the adult realm? Um, well, at Sesame Street, certainly our focus is children, and when we've worked with, with adults, it's often in the service of children, but I think, you know, hopefully we're all lifelong learners, and hopefully we're, always, we're all learning into the future, and um, te television and other media does have power to teach people and help them grow, and um, so 
I, I don't know if it's answering your question, but I, I do think that um, if television's done well, it, it does have the power to teach and entertain um, and do that simultaneously. Does it always have to do that? Uh, certainly there's, there's a lot of reason why you'd want to have entertainment for the sake of entertainment. But um, it's very potent when educational media is, off, is also engaging and the same kinds of formulas that work for children can work very well for adults. Hmm. Trevor, when you talk about empowering people, what do you mean? How does that work? How do you empower people what, what, to do what? Before I, I respond to that, I think that for me, the most dangerous assumption that you can educate uh, people using this means is at the formative age, when kids are young, when, when they are impressionable, I have a problem in, you're right, it could be semantics. But at that age, they're so impressionable. They're so easy to influence. Uh, the, 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 the line between propaganda and forming peop, young kids' minds at that early age, in a particular kind of way, I'll give you a, life, a real life example. I have a six year old who, um, for quite a long time grew uh, was watching CBBS. You familiar with CBBS, BBC? And in, in no short time, um, she was speaking with a British accent. And we switched it off. <laughs> but how many adults, how many fathers, how many parents do that? So I, I, I'm very uncomfortable with the educational role. Um, I, I, I prefer, um, I don't think it's actually semantics. It's a question of providing information and making people make up their minds. The problem with your Sesame Street and that kind of stuff, these are young kids who can't make up their minds. So you're spoon feeding them a certain diet. You're conditioning their minds. But at an adult age, you and me, yes, we are all life learners. But the role of the media for me is imparting knowledge, imparting information, helping people make up their minds, challenging the way they think, which is not education in a way. It's giving people the information to decide what they want to do with their lives, whether they want to pursue the ideas that you've shared or debunk those, notion, those, those kind of notions. Is that education? I, I see it as empowering, giving people information giving them the choices to decide on what they want to do with, uh, with, with their lives. Give you a, a real life example again. The, the whole debate around slavery has come back again. And you're seeing media coming in, giving people information as to where it's taking place and so forth. And there's a groundswell. It's not the right thing to do. You've provided people with information that this thing exists. And society takes the middle ground. That's, that's not the right thing to do. That's my idea of informing and empowering societies, not educating them. You're nodding vehemently. <laughs> Just one small remark, you know. Uh, the main problem, uh, one of the problem, one of the main problems, then people more educated, they are not ready to watch TV. You know, educated person in Russia, the good fashion, when you met somebody, he said, I never watch TV. I has a books, internet, I has a lot of variety possibility. And this is a problem, too. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I agree that it's, uh, this is not just education, there's something more. We must create images. We must create the artistical product. This, if we want, invite people to television, to our program, we must do something much, a little bit more than just education, you know? This, uh, unfortunately, uh, this reality. Hmm. Professor Radamacher, I'd like to ask you a question just on the, in terms of the, uh, of, 
of the intellectual academic background to all this, if, if people are exposed, we've, we've heard from you manipulation, we've heard from Trevor trickery, if people are exposed to that and need to learn to deal with that, how do people learn that? Is it, would it be necessary for young people and for adults to be trained in media, in, in engaging with the media, or is that then another form of manipulation? There is um, always the first big question is, does somebody know what is right or what is wrong? Yeah? And, it, and if I no, would now say, of course, we have to educate them, we have to educate them the right things and so on, then the essential answer is already given because I know what the right things are, I now tell what they should be educated. This is the problem. <laughs> but, but this is not the situation as it is. Situation is much more complicated. Um, I like very much... Um, the position that George Soros takes on all that. He uh, created the uh, Institute of New Economic Thinking as a consequence of the uh, crisis we have in the financial system, which is also a crisis of our economic system. And, and so the, the main thing that Soros says is, as soon as in sciences that deal with the social and the economy, with humans, we, we find something, what we find change the world. So, so we cannot repeat the experiment. This is a path dependency. Whatever we understand, once the thing is out of the bottle, the world is different from before. The, this puts a certain limit on our ability to know what is right or wrong, because we cannot repeat experiments. And he then says, we go to Popper, and, uh, and with Popper, we have at least the idea of falsification. We cannot prove that something is right, but with examples, we can prove that something is wrong. But even this approach only works to the extent that all actors are honest. That means if we talk to each other, the minimum we need is that somebody who says something that he says, I believe that, at least he has to believe what he says that he believes. But, but, but one of our big problem is that a lot of people tell us exactly the contrary of what they believe because they want to achieve something and they know we can achieve it best if we tell those guys that we believe this and they stand there with all their conviction and tell a story from which they know themselves that it is wrong. So, so now you, you ask me in this situation what should we do? Yeah? Um, of, of course, we can go to the United Nations level. This is what I usually do. I go to the United Nations level. I go to the great religions. I go to the great philosophers. And then we can ask, what is it what we all agree upon more or less? It's usually the golden role and, and things like that. And then you would start from those things that we very much agree upon, like the Millennium Development Goals. Yeah? At least in the Millennium Development Goals, all governments said that all children should go to school by 2050. Of course, they did it legally not binding. That was a trick. Because if they would have to do a legally binding declaration with finance obligation, immediately they wouldn't have done it. Because a lot of them does not really want the children in some countries go to school, but rather work as slaves. Yeah? But you cannot say that, so what you do is you say we want them all to go to school. The point is, if you want to go them to school, eventually you have to organize the money. If we say we want the rainforest in the Amazonian, we should pay for it and not pay when it is destroyed. We organize the world where we will pay when it is destroyed, but always declare that we want it to stay. Now, now, I would start from that. I would say, let us take the things that we say that we want, even if some don't want what they say. And, and let's start, let's say, with the Millennium Development Goals. And then we argue, what would we need for that? And then would we go into educating us all about the fact that if it is what we say, the US people would say, put your money where your mouth is. Yeah? So, so if you say that is what you want, children should go to school, then pay for it, yeah? and pay globally for it. And this is not an issue, rich countries, poor countries, and then the poor country. 
under competition that we have, should get all their children educated. This is ridiculous. Because if you look in the inner working of rich countries, they always have a money exchange between their different parts. And, and the more wealthy parts pay for the other parts is completely normal. Otherwise, you couldn't be a state that works. But then you have to do that globally. And this is now where the, what, what I would call the educational mission could work by those who are financed for an educational mission. We have there two ladies, and they have a background where there is, let's say, a money input into this education. And then it becomes a business case in the sense that it is not just the free market, it is a special market. We have the situation in Germany that we have a media law and that we have government money for a particular segment of mania to educate. Those guys should educate. And then they should educate coming from the great charters and try to translate that. Would you like to respond to that or shall we? I have a, my, sitting behind us here is Jana um, Paragis, my colleague from Berlin, and she's been collecting some, uh, some Twitter input for us. And uh, let's see what she's got. Yeah, actually, I want to encourage everyone to send us questions via Twitter because it's your chance now to participate in the panel discussion. And right now they're already busy retweeting all the remarks and comments from the panelists. But uh, please tweet us um, the questions. You can see the hashtag, it's DWGMF, uh, so we can give them to the panelists. Have you got any questions at the moment? No questions yet, only okay. remarks and comments. Dr. Erhard, you've been listening. Would you like to comment? Yeah, I could see that you were scribbling yeah. notes and thinking. Yes, very yes, hard. Th thank you, Peter. Um, my maybe too simple answer uh, to the question of, uh, of quality in media, um, specifically related to the dilemma between quality and economic success would be variety. Um, I do not believe in, I do not even believe in, uh, how would you call it, uh, unmanipulated communication. There's this famous saying of uh, uh, you cannot not communicate, which is true, even by not talking you communicate. Um, and, well, the most personal and heartfelt thing I said this morning was, I love you to my wife, which I said from the really bottom of my heart. But I also said it fully acknowledging that the very fact I say it has an inf effect on her, an effect I like. Um, and I'm pretty sure she's anticipating that effect as well. So um, I, I, to, to, to try to find something which you would call unmanipulating communication is a very complex task. Um, however, if I look specifically on the German media system, which in the past was only run by the TV and radio program, run by state-owned uh, uh, TV stations and, and radio stations, in the meantime has been added with uh, private offers. Some of them, you might say, well, it's only following uh, the question of individual taste of the people viewing it. Still, um, the overall range of of public uh, media offers we have today in Germany is much broader than it was 20 years uh, before, and it's not only including educational uh, information, uh, sorry, uh, um, entertaining information. So I guess what it is all about is to find a way to have media systems that have a, a wealth of different offers, where variety and, and a broad range of opinions is not generated by ensuring that every single article, every single broadcasting station is representing all elements of what you would call reality. You have to have a broad wealth of outlets that at the end of the day create um, a complete picture. And then something that really resonates with me is uh, and here there is an educational job, maybe not for uh, at least the, the electronic media, but surely for media altogether, which is to teach young people how the media work. I had that, uh, for me, kind of mind-opening experience of my little son who is 10 years old. I have two boys, 13 and 10, and the younger one approaching me um, and saying, you know, uh, Dad, I'm just looking TV at the moment, and I just took a pen and I wrote down between the programs, there were 18 advertising slots. Um, and they even made advertising for some stuff that my friends and myself know already, it's not good, doesn't work, don't like it. Why do they do that? 
So we were sitting down and I explained him. Uh, and so he started to get his first glimpse into how the media system works. And I guess this is something we have to start. And here I'm fully with most of the people speaking uh, in front of me. Let's make sure that young people understand the logic of what's going around, uh, uh, around them. And then they can pick their own educated choices of how to inform themselves, how to make informed customers' decisions. Mm. Thank you for those comments.